This is Play by Playcast. Is that faster than a greyhound? The podcast about play by play guys. For play by play guys, I am told a play by play guy. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. Now, here's the host of Play by Play Cast, Todd Bodet. <laughs> Wait, the Motel 6 guy? We'll leave the light on for you. No, Joel Godet. Joe Godet. Joel. Joe. Joel? Joel, with an L. Okay, here's your host, Joel Godet. Don't worry, nobody's listening anyway. <laughs> Hi, hey, hello, how are you? Back at it here with Play by Play Cast on a Friday morning. Joel Gadet, glad to have you along with us. Thanks as always for clicking subscribe, hitting download, joining us here on iTunes or Stitcher, rating us or reviewing us. If you enjoy the podcast as well, throw some stars or a review our way. Uh, always appreciate it. You can find us on Twitter as well, at PXPCast, or you can find myself at Joel Godet, J O E L G O D E T T. You can shoot me an email as well, the old work email. Uh, J-G-O-D-E-T-T at B-S-U for Ball State University at B-S-U dot E-D-U. Hope you enjoyed our conversation last week with Dave Jagler. If you want to go back and listen to that, you can do that in the archive. Uh, Tony Caridi was episode 61 before that. Jared Sandler of the Texas Rangers. Victor Rojas of the Angels. Josh Lewin of the Mets and UCLA before that. And then Craig Bowlerjack uh, from the Utah Jazz was episode 57. All of our episodes are archived all the way back to number one with Carter Blackburn um, free and open to you in uh, the iTunes store or on Stitcher. Hey, it's the last podcast before all hell breaks loose for the fall. We were talking to Tony Caridi a couple of weeks ago about what this time of year is like for him uh, when it comes to preparing for a college football season. College football season is upon us. Uh, Ball State opens up next week at Illinois on Saturday. Uh, I've got a game before that. I've got a game, uh, a volleyball match Friday night. Ball State will take on Bradley uh, at home inside Worthen Arena, so I've got that one as well. Uh, so we are full go. There is a solid chance I'm going to be reporting, uh, re- recording this podcast at like 3 a.m. next week because as much of a prep nerd as I am, I prep early in the week. Uh, my Sunday so I guess a couple days from now, is usually when I sit down with my depth chart and kind of put guys in place on my chart and and really dive into my research. Uh, My Sundays are kind of shot, socially speaking, uh, when it comes to to college football season. But that being said, I'm also a last kind of second finishing touches kind of guy. So like my Thursday nights and even my Friday nights, I'm still scouring trying to find nuggets and things like that. Uh, Many a Friday night, I fall asleep with my chart on my chest, just like continuously memorizing numbers. So uh, (laughs) we'll see. We'll see how this goes next week. Uh, I've got got the the Friday volleyball, then the Sunday uh, football, or the Saturday football. Just have the one football game the next week, and then the next week I have volleyball, Thursday, Friday, football, Saturday. It's going to be fun. Uh, But, hey. That's why we do it. We are uh, we are in it to call games and uh, back in the swing of things finally after an agonizingly long summer. You get to take vacations during the summer when you work in college athletics, but uh, it, it goes on forever. You just kind of want this time of year to come back around, so uh, glad it is finally here. Our guest this week on the podcast is somebody that I've gotten a couple of requests for uh, Bob Joyce, friend of the pod, uh, he's been a guest before. I think if you go back into the the, the 30s, I think you'll you'll find his uh, his episode. Uh, Bob Joyce once uh, said that I should reach out to Alan Bestwick and have him on the podcast, and uh, we did that this week. Uh, had a chance to talk with Alan um, while he was uh, actually taking his son to college um, last week. Uh, we spent some time on the phone and talked a lot about racing in particular, which is what Alan is most well identified with in a broadcasting sense. Uh, and, and we talk about um, climbing the ranks of racing broadcasting, accessibility to athletes in racing broadcasting, uh, storytelling in racing, calling the Indy 500. We get into all of that stuff, and then we get into uh, all of the different sports he's called on top of that. We'll talk about tennis, we'll talk about golf, we'll talk about college football, and we also do touch at the very end Uh, about the ESPN layoffs that happened back at the beginning of the year as well. Alan, unfortunately, uh, was part of that. 
and uh, is excited about what new projects he has on the horizon or and, and what those could be for him. We'll touch on all that at the end as well. Uh, it was I, I felt weird asking about it, but I was curious, uh, and we'll get into it, about it from a couple of different standpoints. Um, and I appreciated Alan being uh, open and honest about it. So we do get to that toward the end of the conversation as well. Alan Bestwick is our guest here on PXPCast, and we're going to dive right into it with a guy who grew up around the racetrack. Sure. I, it, it actually was two separate things. Um, my da- First of all, my dad got out of racing when I was, let's see, seven, when I was 11. Okay. Um, he stopped, he stopped, uh, he stopped having cars, couldn't afford it anymore. Had to choose between putting tires on the race car or, you know, putting food on the table for his wife and kids and fortunately made the right choice. <laughs> um, but, um, I just always wanted to be the guy on the radio or TV. You know, um, I was a sports addict from the time I was young. I played football, hockey and baseball, um, you know, three sports and, and, you know, nonstop all summer. And, um, I just always wanted to be the guy on the radio or the TV. I, I wanted to do that. Uh, my public high school had a radio club um, that, while I was there, was turned into an actual FM radio station. So I started broadcasting as a disc jockey and doing high school football games and whatnot when I was uh, a sophomore in high school. Um, separately from that, um, My dad and I were at the races one night at the track he used to work at, and we literally walked by the promoter. And, um, you know, my dad stopped him, and, you know, they were having a conversation. And um, my dad introduced me and said, my kid's, uh, you know, he's on the radio, and, you know, he'd love to to be one of your announcers one day. Um, And the guy said, follow me, and walked me upstairs into the tower and tapped the announcer on the shoulder and said, let the kid do the street stocks. (laughs) And... And that's, that's literally how that started. So my, my broadcasting racing wasn't something I set out to do, but knowing something about racing created opportunities for me um, that people who didn't know something about it uh, you know, weren't able to take advantage of down the road. Yeah, I mean, when did you decide that, that racing was going to be kind of your niche or your, 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 your foray into, into the world of broadcasting? In 1986, early 1986, um, I was working at the Mutual Broadcasting System, which was a radio network at the time out of Washington, D.C. Uh, it was actually where the Larry King Show came from and other things. Um, and ran across a guy that I had met earlier in my career uh, who now was, a, was running Motor Racing Network, MRN. And he offered me a job a couple of weeks later. Um, so I, again, I, I didn't set out. I was well on my way in a broadcasting career that had nothing to do with racing. Uh, but this job opportunity came up to move to Daytona Beach and go to work for MRN. Um, and as a race fan, that was very appealing to me. And I, I said, absolutely. And so that's sort of what started it. We had uh, we had Mark Janes on the podcast back uh, Indy 500 week, and uh, one of the things he and I talked about was the fact that even though I live in Indianapolis, I'd never been I'd never even been to IMS until this year. Actually, um, after we, we we did the episode, I went to Pole Day, um, and yep. that, that was my first exposure to it. So for for someone who is more of a novice to um, the racing world, be it IndyCar, NASCAR, or, or what have you, um, what's the What's the ladder like in broadcasting from a racing standpoint for guys that go through it and go to minor league baseball and, and make the, the climbs up the rungs or, or go to colleges and different things of that nature and, and climb that ladder as well? Um, what's the path in racing or, or kind of what was the path that you carved out to, to build yourself up to eventually uh, where you got with NBC and ESPN eventually? Well, I think I think that my story might have been a little different than than a more common path, but for a lot of people, it 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 starts at local racetracks and local radio stations or local TV stations, and um, you know, advances with networking, you know, making contacts, um, meeting people, showing up, volunteering. Uh, we got a number of people over the years um, that started out as runners. You know, gophers, basically, uh, low-paid gophers helping out during 
telecasts on weekends or during radio broadcast weekends, just volunteering, dragging cable, um, filling coolers, whatever it took. And those contacts that you make um, get you opportunities. I could make a list of people who literally auditioned for MRN um, during a practice session whenever it went out and stuck them in the corner, guys that work at racetracks or radio stations and, you know, try to see if they, if they showed that they could do it and um, who, who then worked their way, you know, on up the ladder. So it's, it's not much different than any other job. It's about the people you meet and how hard you're willing to work um, to make those connections go someplace. What's it like calling a, a small town race uh, when you're starting out and you're doing it on the local radio station at the track where you might not know a lot about the drivers. Uh, can you take me back to those early races and, and how you, how you did it and how you got yourself set to do it? Well, there's, there's the, the first premise that, you know, can never exist in, in any broadcast that you do at any level was, you know, it's, you know, you didn't not know about the drivers. You got there early, you went down into the pit area, you introduced yourself to people, you talked to them, you asked questions, you got their story. Um, that's sort of um, uh, a staple of the business. Preparation is, is inescapable. Did that make so, you better? You, did that make you better later on having done it at that level where you, it's not so much, oh, absolutely. the stuff's not written, you have to go find it yourself. Absolutely. And, and it's, you know, hey, it's that way at the big level too. There's no substitution at the Indianapolis 500 for walking down into the garages and talking to the drivers and engineers and owners. You, you know, you could read things that other people collect all you want or things that they put out, but there's no substitution for asking your own questions and finding out the information that your instincts tell you, your viewers or your listeners want to hear or see. Um, so yeah, that's, that's it from the very beginning. You know, you go to do a high school football game, you got to, you know, talk to the other coach of the visiting team, you may know everything about your team and you may talk to the coach four times a week at practice, but you better find out something about the visiting team and who his players are and what their stories are. So you know what to, to relay to your listeners or viewers as that game goes on. What's your favorite, or I guess, what's your most informative, what do you find is the most informative question you can ask when you go down to the pits and you're trying to get to know a a driver um, and their backstory and, and what they're trying to do on that given day? Um, I don't know that it's the most informative question, but it's always a good conversation builder is who's your hero? Who do you want to be like? Are you, you know, do you pattern yourself after someone? What's, you know, what's the guy when you watch race or play or skate or, you know, that, that you think, Hey, that's, that guy's got it. Um, it gives you an insight into their thinking and oftentimes gets people to open up as to what's important to them, um, and their, their mindset, their thought process during the race. Gives you a common point of reference, I guess would be a way to say it. Who was your hero? <laughs> My hero was Jim McKay. Um, and you might be young to remember him, but Jim was was the host of ABC's Wide World of Sports and ABC's Olympic coverage for forever. And when I was a kid, um, if it was an important event, if it was a big event, um, Jim was there and he was bringing it to you. And I feel he was a somewhat soft-spoken man. I never met him. He was a soft-spoken man. Um, he never made it about him, but he always gave you the impression that he cared about those he was covering and their stories and he was a wonderful storyteller. Um, and I, um, I always felt strongly that, that, you know, it's not about me. It's about the people I'm covering and, and that making you care about them is really important to, to your developing a rooting interest in this and following it and watching it and uh, staying with it, especially in the, you know, the day and age of the 500 channels and the, the instant remote control and all the rest. Is there something you would ask him if you would have gotten the opportunity to meet him? Oh, it wouldn't have been just one thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, might have just said, Jim, why? <laughs> How? How? You know, because he did it in times when they were creating an industry. You know, we take for granted now that we could go to London and televise Wimbledon back and take all 18 courts and put them on some, you know, some feed somewhere that someone can watch. Um you know, they were going to go do a, a USA, USSR track meet in Russia 
and they were going to transmit it back live via satellite to New York. And that had never, ever been done before, you know. And, and this was at the time when, you know, they were going behind the Iron Curtain and they had to navigate all those politics and stuff. So they created a lot of the sports industry that we know today and, and have carried on since. And so I'd, I'd love to know a lot about, you know, inspiration and, and, um, and the backstories of, uh, of a lot of these things and how they came to be. I'm sure it was a fascinating career. I've, I've actually read books on the man and, and, um, and seen a lot of these stories and, and very inspiring. That's interesting. I've never thought of it that way. Um, Because I I feel like anytime I would have asked that question, usually the answer is something technically related. Um, But the history aspects out of it is cool. And it's neat to think about um, where people were and what they saw and what they were dealing with when they were in in similar shoes to to where you're at. Um, So it's an interesting answer. And, and, you know, the, the other, the other part of that is those who don't study history are doomed to, are, you know, are, you know, doomed to repeat its mistakes, right? Well, there have been mistakes made in the past, and if you, you don't study them and understand them, no matter what field you're in, how do you keep from repeating them? So uh, that, that's part of that process, too. What's the best thing you've learned from history, then? Uh, is there something that, that you, you read in a book um, or, or that picked somebody's brain that said, this is, this is something that, that still sticks with me? <laughs> the best thing I've learned from history is that if there's a microphone around, you always assume that it's an open one. <laughs> and if there's a camera around, you always assume that it's going into a tape machine someplace. Um, especially in a, in a YouTube universe now, you can find plenty of examples out there that will live forever of people saying things they shouldn't say or putting themselves in bad situations um, You know that never go away. I was going to say, uh, I feel like there's a good story to go along with that one. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I, you know, you pick it. There's a, there's a true uh, pe- people, you know, the, the newscasters that say, uh, say unfortunate things um, <laughs> during a commercial break. Well, that, you know, that, that microphone is going into a tape machine somewhere and yep. somebody leaks that out. Now you got a problem. You know, the guy that, that um, uh, the, there was a camera on him, uh, in the booth of a sporting event, and he didn't think anything uh, about it. He needed to change into his suit, so he just changed into his suit. <laughs> you know, and the camera was on it. It was going into the TV truck, and there were employees in the TV truck who perhaps didn't take too kindly to him just rolling in front of them. So, you know, I mean, all these things you have to, you know, you have to bear in mind your work environment. You're always on, no matter where you are, no matter what you do, you are always on duty. What was the first, in your, the, the way that you looked at it, what was the first big race that you got a chance to, to cover? Um, and do you, do you remember the feeling of walking into that environment for the first time and just kind of soaking that in and uh, living on a, on a bigger stage for the first time? I can remember being at Daytona because when I went to work for MRN, our offices were at Daytona and were in the infield of the Speedway. Okay. Um, and... Um, I can I can remember being at Daytona and walking around the garage and and you know I'd been there for a while and you know 50 weeks out of the year the place is quiet and you're going in there you know during the week and doing your business and then traveling off to races on the weekend and and, and whatnot but I can remember the first speed weeks at Daytona where the garage filled up around our office building and you're out in the garage and you're you know you're trying to gather information and so on. And I can remember walking up to Bobby Allison and Bobby asking me questions about me. You know, he sees the MRN shirt and so on, but you know, you're the new guy, right? Yes, I am, sir. You know, um, where, where are you from and all that kind of thing. And, and I can remember him saying to me, uh, Barney Hall was the anchor man, you know, the voice of NASCAR for, for 60 years. It seemed like, um, until his passing um, a little over a year ago. And Barney was, he was there for the whole history of the thing from the beginning. He called every day Tona 500 but one um, and until his passing. And um, I can remember Bobby looking at me and saying, well, Barney says you're okay, so you're okay by me. Wow. Yeah. That's a, a Bobby Allison just said, I'm okay. <laughs> that's a big, that's a, that's a big deal. You know, and I can I can remember having a similar experience with Richard Petty, 
um, sitting down with Richard to do some things uh, that we were taping for a show we were going to produce. And, uh, and Richard being, uh, being very kind and accommodating with his time. And, you know, think about it. It's Richard Petty we're talking about. Um, the King and one of the most recognizable sports figures in America. So I've, those are a couple early um, moments where, you know, you just you stop and you said, wow, this is crazy. I've always heard that people you know, say this, that this is me. I, I've heard that people say that, that, that drivers in particular are, and I don't mean this like negatively versus other athletes, but like drivers are some of the more normal guys you can talk to in sports and down to earth and good conversationalists. Um, what was it like for you talking to guys like that and, you know, Richard Petty and, and Dale Earnhardt and, um, and I guess their accessibility and their openness and, how how did you find that, and and how would you kind of uh, stack that with? I don't I don't want to say compare it with other with other sports and things like that, but uh, are drivers on the whole, I guess, broadcaster friendly? Yes, uh, for the most part, and 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 there's there's two reasons why I think they are maybe more accessible than most others. One is. Their livelihood partly depends on outside sponsorship. True. And those outside sponsors are looking for media exposure as part of the formula for how much money they'll spend or want to spend or are willing to spend. So, um, you know, people like Baylor Hart and, and Kerry Yarbrough and, you know, I mean, pick, pick the great driver, you know, A.J. Foyt understood that. They may not, it may not always have been convenient for them and they may not always have enjoyed the process. But they understood it, that it was part of, you know, raising the funding to do what they loved to do so much, which was, which was race. It was necessary. Uh, the other part of it is most racers have a, have a, a very blue-collar mentality. And what I mean by that is before you get to Indianapolis or before you get to Daytona, you've raced at a Hickory, North Carolina, or a Seacock, Massachusetts, or a Kokomo, Indiana. Um, and you probably had to build your own equipment or take care of your own equipment to do it. You had to fix it when you wrecked it. You had to find the money to pay for it when you wrecked it. And a lot of those guys had real jobs during the day and then worked on their race car at night and then went and raced it on the weekend. Well, that kind of um, work ethic, I think, kept them a little more grounded. Um, there are very few race drivers that are told from the time they're eight years old um, True. that they're, that they're going to be a star or that they're the next big thing or that they're, you know, because they're bigger or faster or more athletic than the next one. They have, they have to work to get the opportunity to show that, even if they're a great racer. I mean, A.J. Foyt had to work at racing every day of his career. And so I think it gives them a little bit of a different perspective. The other athletes that are like that, I think, are hockey players because it's not uncommon for hockey players to be at practice at six in the morning, you know, and then go to school um, and then get their work done and then go back and work on, you know, practice some more at night. Or where they, they grow up with a, um, a small town mentality that lends itself more to, um, to not being big time. Sure. If, you know, if, if that makes sense, you know what I mean? hundred percent. So, so, um, hockey players and race drivers, very, very much uh, a little more accessible than some other worlds. I want to ask you about crews, uh, not in a racing sense, but in a, in a broadcasting sense as well, because I, I've read a couple of articles where you have talked about, uh, the crew of a racing broadcast, um, and a little bit how it's different than, a basketball or a football broadcast. And I, I think I saw like one of them mentioned that they can be as large as 150 people. Um, and you're there for several days. You're not just showing up, doing the game and leaving. Um, what's different about a racing broadcast crew and uh, the way that you guys have to function together and, and work as a unit and a family? Well, I think first of all, the, the size of the team the complexity of the telecast, you know, most basketball games these days are done with four cameras and the equipment is set up the day of the game. The game is shot that evening and then it's torn down 
and everybody goes their separate ways. And a lot of the crews are local. Very few people travel from site to site to site, except the announcers and maybe the producer and director. Um, the racing crew, it's a team that travels from week to week to week to week to week to week together. So you spend in, you know, four days on the road together with these people um, for however many weeks a year your, your, your schedule is. Be it, you know, the 20 weeks in IndyCar or the 40 weeks in NASCAR. And you literally spend more time with those people than you spend with your own family. So you develop some incredibly deep friendships. You literally, you witness people's children being born, people's parents passing away, um, life events you witness together um, that you maybe don't get in other sports where, where they don't spend that, uh, that kind of time together. Uh, so so it's, a, it's, a, it's a really deep bond that you form with these people that, um, that you create some incredible friendships um, that, are, that are hard to break. What's the complexity of a, a, a broadcast like from your standpoint as well? Because you know, if you compare it to a regular football or basketball, you've got four cameras. Uh, you've got a couple of replay angles, and well, that's about it. Uh, you've got somebody on the sideline. Uh, you might have an, you know, if you get to a certain level, you might have an official, you know, back in New York to to talk about flags and replays. Um, but when when you you watch a race and you've got all your pit reporters, um, you've got all your cameras in cars, um, and the 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 amount of different ways you can portray a story. Uh, can you explain the complexity of that and, and how you guys weave that story? Sure, I'll give you, I'll give you two examples of the complexity. And, and the first one is an illustration. Picture a cameraman. That camera is about, what did they tell me? Was it 35 pounds or was it 65 pounds? I know it's a big difference. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can lift one of but, them. Yeah. But, but the, the effective weight of swinging that camera, okay, so that race car is coming past you at 230 miles an hour in Indianapolis. And we want you to frame, pan, tilt, zoom, and focus. <laughs> Every lap. Go. You know, so that's just one cameraman um, in the entire production that has to be that talented with his machine and his skill to do all of those functions every lap and change, change cars at a minute. We want to drop back five cars and talk about some other, you know, and you got to be able to do that. Uh, so, and that's just one example. Think about the guy that sits, sits at the audio console at a race. Every one of those cameras has a microphone on it, plus all the announcer microphones, plus all the tape machine audio, plus all the, you know, and he makes it all happen. Well, he's, he's got, got all he probably the, have driver audio too, right? Yep, driver audio, the radios that can mix up, but just, just the A1, just the head audio mixer. He has to coordinate all of that down into something that leaves the racetrack and sounds good at home when it gets to you. <laughs> Enorm enormously talented and enormously complex setup just to get it all ready, uh, but enormously talented uh, as the day goes on. The other difference between other sports and racing is, is this. If you're covering a football game, uh, you and I were talking about uh, football for a second earlier. If you have a camera on the ball, you're going to have 90% of the story covered, no matter what happens, right? Everything else is just trying to fill in the backstory, be it an injury or a key block or, you know, whatever it was. But if you've got a camera on the ball, you're going to have 90% of the story covered. Where's the ball in a race? Where is the ball at the Indy 500? Is it the leader? There's 30 is of them. Is it fifth place? <laughs> is it ninth place? Is it on pit road? Is it back at the medical center? Where is the ball? And that decision has to be made every second of every minute that you're on the air. Where's the ball? What's the most important thing I need to be talking about right now? And sometimes there's more than one ball in the air. And you have to be careful not to drop any of them. So I might not have covered that at the moment, but I've got to come back and clean that up, or I've got to go do this, or I've got to go do that. Oh, this is more important. Let's go do this. You know, it's, it's, it's hard. It's, it's complex. And um, we sometimes like to laugh and say, if anybody ever stood in our production truck and listened to the communication circuits that are going on, <laughs> that you'd, you'd wonder why we ever got anything right ever, uh, because there's so much communication and so much feedback all coming in 
from so many angles all at once. But that's why the people who do it are as good as they are, uh, the producers and directors and, and so on, because they take all that and make that decision constantly of what's the most important thing right now, uh, every minute of that race. Is there a system you have to help you keep track of that in a race, in the moment? Uh, me? No. Instinct. Um, you know, I just, I've, I've done so many of these things, and I've, I've watched races for so many years. I have, um, I have the ability uh, or the instinct to look and feel what the big picture is. Um, and, and try and, and, uh, and help understand that, help the producer understand that. Uh, we back each other up. We make sure, you know, one of us isn't missing something, the other see. But it's just, it's, it's, it's a skill. Um, it's an art. Uh, it's an experiment every minute. But, you, you know, that's, I guess that's, that's part of the talent of it is, uh, is being able to, to look at those pictures and understand what they mean. I know people always try to reinvent the way that we watch sports in a lot of different ways as well. And, and because of all of that with racing, and there are so many different balls in the air and so many different ways to watch things, um, I was curious your thoughts. Uh, I know you did the backseat driver broadcast in 2009. Um, and and uh, I, I guess your thoughts on the different approaches of, of ways to be able to, to watch racing on television of basically not having a, a play-by-play voice, but having five guys that know what they're talking about, just talk about it amongst themselves and, and kind of go from there. Yeah, the um, uh, if, if you do the same thing over and over and over again, um, you know, when does it cease to become special? So trying new things to freshen it up every now and then, um, I think is always fun. Hey, what if? Is a, is a common, you know, brainstorming thing. Hey, what if? You know, where can we put a camera that there's never been one before? Where can we put a microphone that there's never been one before? What can we show you about the Indianapolis Motor Speedway that a hundred previous years they've never been able to show you before? You know, some, some of those questions are more challenging to answer than others. Uh, some of those questions have, have technical limitations or budget limitations. You know, um, some of them have safety limitations. There's... Um, there's a lot of considerations to, to all of those things, but um, I, I, you know, I'm all about new ideas and every, every decision is filtered through the same philosophy for me. People can't have fun watching television if you're not having fun making television. What can we do that's fun? You know, you always do that while respecting the competition. Your first job is to document the event you're covering, you know, be, be journalistically appropriate. But how can we have fun? What would be cool? What would be cool? What would you like to see if, if you were at the helm of a, if you were a decision maker, how would you like to portray racing a little bit differently? You know, hey, man, wouldn't that be fun to be able to, to, to have a, a camera on a driver's visor of his helmet? That'd be cool. So when he's looking, we could see how his head moves around. So, well, we managed to make that happen this year. Um, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, now that the, it took a long time to develop the technology, there was safety testing involved, the, you know, aerodynamic testing involved, um, but it happened. And it was fun, and the race fans love it, and it's a place we were never able to put a camera before. Next thing for me, there's so much data streaming from these race cars to these pit boxes, every second of every lap of every race. People, people would be stunned to know the volume of data that these race teams are looking at in real time, because I was when I first, you know, NASCAR doesn't have a lot of the data, but, uh, but an IndyCar does. And when I first came to IndyCar and teams, you know, pulled the curtain back and showed me this data, I was stunned. And then I immediately said, why aren't we showing this to the people at home? <laughs> you know, so, but you know, there's competitive concerns and, you know, you work the politics and so on. But at some point I feel confident you're going to be able to see more of this data at home that these cars are producing. You want to talk about high tech? These cars are computers on wheels. Yeah. And it's amazing the things that they're able to look at. If I can, uh, if I can move from w- racing real quick too, um, what was it like for you when uh, you got the ability in, in I guess, like 2014 um, to 
go to St. Andrews to do the U.S. Open to to really dive into basketball and football and hockey and, and do some Wimbledon um, and really, really uh, expose yourself to a ton of different things and have some different challenges that way. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, you know, as, as I said to you earlier, I didn't set out to be a racing broadcaster. That's, yeah. It's an opportunity that opened up for me and, and, um, and certainly it's been, it's been great for me and I've loved every minute of it, but I'm also a fan of all sports. Uh, when someone says to you, Hey, you want to go to Wimbledon? Now that's one of those moments when you when 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 you walk through the gates and onto the grounds and you go, "Are you kidding me? This is cool." Um, yeah, it's been fun. I you know I love all sports. I really do. I um, I'm a I'm a I'm a fan of just about anything. And so the opportunity to to go someplace and do something, the bigger the event, the better. But to do tennis from Wimbledon or from the U.S. Open in New York, to do golf from St. Andrews. Um, to go do college football in some of the places that I've gotten to, to go do it from Texas A&M to Tennessee to Wisconsin to even Washington State last year. What a blast. You know, just a lot of fun. And um, just put me in, Coach. What's next, you know? <laughs> What's next for Alan Bestwick? Uh, U.S. Open in a couple of weeks. Um, I'm going to work the world feed. So we'll be uh, all of these – Big tennis tournaments produce a feed that is sent to their broadcast partners around the world, and um, they're all staffed with uh, with full commentary and so on. Sometimes the host broadcaster uses the World Feed announce team. Sometimes they use their own. Um, but I'm going to be part of the World Feed announce team for the U.S. Open for a couple of weeks in New York City, nice. and um, and then we'll step back and we'll see. It's um, interesting time in, in uh, the business and in, in my career. And I, um, I think there's some exciting things just around the corner, but, um, but in the meantime, we'll wait and see what those are. What is that feeling like? Um, if I, if I, if I may, um, we all, everybody that gets into this industry strives to get to a place like NBC or ESPN and have the success and career that you had had for decades. Um, when you get that phone call in April, um, how do you step back and, and kind of evaluate like, oh, okay, now, now what? Um, and, and go from well, there. Well, first things first is if you got into this business, you better expect that there's going to be ups and downs. Uh, there's no one in the business. And I emphasize no one, um, that it's all up all the way, all the time. I don't care who it is. Um, so, so, you know, it's a, it's a competitive business. It's a, it's a personal preference business. Uh, it's a business that's financial model is changing. And, you know, this is, this is part of it right from the beginning. It's, it's, it's part of the business and you accept that. I look at it in, in a couple of ways. I look at it that, um, did I do everything that I could do? You know, what was it me? And, you know, the answer to that comes back, no. Um, these are financial decisions that are made, and, you know, okay, it's, it's, it's what it is. Um, I, I, have, I have really good company in, um, in this group that got those phone calls. Yeah. I, I, I look at it as, you know what? If this all is over right now, if I've worked my last whatever, man, this has been everything I dreamed it could have been and then some. You know, I mean, I look, I've gotten to do the Daytona 500, the Indianapolis 500, Wimbledon, the U.S. Open, um, work some of the great college football venues in, in this nation, uh, golf at St. Andrew. You know, I mean, I've gotten to do so much um, that I will be eternally grateful. That said, I don't believe it's over. Um, I've got more to give. I, um, you know, it's, it's, um, Sometimes being patient is the hardest part, but, you know, people resign, people get fired, jobs turn over, rights change hands, um, things shake up. And um, when that next door opens, be prepared to step through it. And I, you know, I have, uh, I have good faith that that next door will open sometime, sometime in the near future. We live in such an age of social media, too, now, for better or worse. Um, 
And it was interesting because like, you scroll back through your Twitter feed. Uh, we also work in an industry where uh, you don't see the audience you speak to. Uh, and, and sometimes social media lets them talk back to you now more than it used to. But uh, the amount of outpouring that it, it looked like you got from people that appreciate your work uh, had to be in some senses validating, even in that moment, um, that people thought enough to reach out and let you know um, what they thought about following along uh, with the races that, that they were with you with or with you for. Yeah, it's 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 what you do this for. I mean, obviously, you do it to make a living from your family, too, and sure. you do it for the enjoyment. But the, the ultimate end result is you're doing this for the people that are watching. And... Um, it's a great compliment for people that are watching to care enough um, to think that you're a friend, even though they've never met you. Um, those kinds of things are a great compliment to, uh, to, to a broadcaster. I've been blessed to, to receive many of those uh, over the years. And, um, you know, yeah, it is gratifying. I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's nice to know that, um, that people aren't saying, okay, good riddance. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, um, it is, uh, it is a different time we live in the, uh, the instant feedback and, um, the, the ability for people to create a conversation is both good and bad. Sometimes they create that conversation without full knowledge of, uh, of information or circumstance. Um, without full context, um, but sometimes um, it's also very informative, and and you know getting that 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 instant feedback is uh, is is helpful at times too. So it is. It's a very different time we live in for sure. One more question, if I can, and I've taken uh, more than enough of your time, so I appreciate it. Um, but on that note, where do you look at broadcasting uh, going? And and how do you what direction do you see what we do traveling and the changes that are happening? Well, I think it's headed down a really interesting path. Um, obviously, the choice of younger people to stream things on devices versus watch them on a television is an interesting one, um, because the aggregation of the monies from the television. Uh, you know, cable bills and so on is what's allowed a lot of these sports to flourish like they have. Um, as everybody goes to these over-the-top services and the streaming subscriptions and so on, I wonder where the tipping point is at media outlets being able to monetize um, those streams. How many subscriptions can you have? Yeah. You know, right now, right now people buy Netflix uh, or Hulu or whatever it is they buy. Well, how many of those individual subscriptions are people going to put together? How many people are going to buy Netflix and then turn around and buy Amazon Prime and then turn around and buy the MLB package? You're paying, or buy, you're paying the same amount you know, at the end of the day, yeah. Buy the ESPN package. And how will the technology change going forward to make it a little more convenient for you to jump back and forth between all of those different subscriptions that you have? Yeah, It's not the easiest thing to do right now, right? Um, where's that going to go? How will the, the players involved in the digital side of the business change the business further? Uh, that's what I'm curious to see. Um, you know, I, I'm very, very interested to see that Amazon just bought the rights to the men's tennis tour um, in the United Kingdom. Uh, they just bought the rights to, you know, if you want to watch Andy Murray play in the United Kingdom, except for the Grand Slams, you're going to stream it on the Amazon um, app. That's where you're going to get it. Really interesting. Mm. Um, I'll be curious to see where it goes and how that model works for them, how they're able to monetize it, what kind of ratings do the tennis tours get? How does that affect their sponsorship sales as they go out to, uh, to market things and tournaments and so on? So it's, it's, it's a rapidly changing business. I'm old enough to remember when cable TV first came in um, and ESPN was a new startup thing and CNN was actually one of two news networks. There was also a thing called Satellite News Channel that most people wouldn't remember. Um, you know, I, I lived through that 
I'm curious to see what it's going to be like to live through this and where it ends up, you know, the next time these rights contracts come up to bid. Um, Alan, if people want to get in touch with you um, or, or reach out to you on social media, how do they do it? Uh, at Alan Bestwick, A-L-L-E-N on Twitter is uh, probably the best way. I'm uh, kind of keeping a low profile uh, at the moment these days. I've got Facebook and Instagram and Instagram and all that stuff, or as Bill Belichick calls it, InstaTwit. Um, <laughs> I think it's InstaFace, or, isn't it? Or InstaFace yeah. or uh, Twit, Twit Chat or whatever it is he calls it. <laughs> I get I, I get a chuckle out of that. But, uh, but I'm out there. I'm not hard to find. Alan Bestwick joining us here on the podcast. And like I said at the beginning, really appreciate Alan being uh, open and honest about the, the things we talked about there at the end of the, the interview. Uh, but it's uh, the whole thing as a whole. And, and we'll go back to the beginning and, and talk about kind of the, the window into broadcasting racing. It's something I haven't done. I don't want to say a lot of. It's something I've never done ever. Uh, so very much like when we had Mark Janes on back in the 500 week. Uh, this was just kind of a neat episode for me to look into something that is new and different uh, that I've never been exposed to. And uh, hopefully some of you out there that are racing fans uh, could uh, empathize a little bit more uh, directly with uh, some of the, the experiences that Alan has had. And for those of you that are not acquainted with broadcasting racing, hopefully it was a really good window into a, a side of the industry and a part of the industry that is a uh, different than, than things that you've been exposed to in the past. I, I think the, the crew stuff is interesting and something you don't think about, you know, in a basketball or college football sense where you show up that day and you do the game and you go home. Uh, and, and even if it's a little bit more than that in terms of preparation a day before, or, you know, if you're doing an NFL game or a college football game, you're on the phone talking throughout the week. But in racing, you guys are, you guys are together and you're on the road and you're together for days at a time. Um, and a lot of people have asked questions uh, of me to, to ask of guests in terms of how important crews are and how important uh, people behind the scenes are to a broadcast. I think you got the answer uh, to that question very much uh, with, with this episode with Alan Bestwick here today. Uh, that'll do it for us, though, uh, on this episode. Enjoy college football season coming up. Uh, <laughs> you only get it once. It's only the start of the season one time a year. Everybody's 0-0. And you get those uh, first game kickoff jitters, first game kickoff excitement. Uh, that all only comes once. So enjoy it uh, as uh, the season gets underway. Next week, really fun guest. And uh, we're going to talk about a host of different things, ranging from basketball. We'll touch on some football a little bit. We will touch on MMA. We will touch on some professional wrestling uh, things because uh, both our guests next week and myself happen to be uh, fairly large fans of WWE. So uh, I will leave that as your carrot. Uh, see if you can't put the carrot and stick together over the next seven days about who our guest is next week. But I'm excited for, uh, for that episode. Uh, so with that as your tease, we'll hit the marshmallow music and talk to you next week. This is Play by Play Cast. Many thanks to you, as always, for hitting subscribe or download. Many thanks to Alan Bestwick. My name is Joel Gadette, and we are out.